This is the December show with MPP, Bobby and Brady. Norfolk, Bobby, it's great to see you. How are you? I'm great, Dave. It's a Friday and feeling good and have, a, have had a productive week. But you know, these weeks go fast. I really gauge my my life by these podcasts. And it's like, okay, you know, it's a, it's another month until Dave and I get together, but that month goes so fast. And it's, you, you know, you're probably, um, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. I really do. Um, and I, I always feel like I'm pressuring you because I'm saying, well, tell me why this isn't working. Fix this. You know, I, I feel like <laughs> I'm being that guy. But the whole point, point of it is, and you and I both agree on this, is to have the conversations to educate Absolutely. people and to make change. That's the only way we're going to do it as a group Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. And they've got to be honest for all conversations. I, I yeah. you know, I kind of, uh, I got to confess something. I did another podcast last week. Great. Uh, a gentleman out of Waynefleet who, uh, he's a pizza, like he does pizza reviews and he's a real estate agent, Joe Gonzalez, great guy. And uh, he, he saw my story somewhere and he said, will you come on my show? I said, yeah, absolutely. And we were on there for an, an hour and 45 minutes. And he said to me afterwards, he says, you know, it, as a politician, he says, you don't use any messaging. And I said, well, I don't have to use messaging because I don't have to stick to a party line. And he says, if, if people don't believe you after they watch my podcast, he says, I'm not sure which politician, you know, they are going to believe kind of thing. And I said, it's because like... It's important to have these honest, raw conversations, and we don't always have to agree, but the conversation is paramount. It has to happen. That's right. the only way things get accomplished. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to start this month because I see uh, that you're on a new standing committee, and I wanted to ask you about that social policy. Now, I knew you were on finance. I want you to do a two-part question. Explain yeah. to the folks what a standing committee is and explain why you went from one to the other. I, I'm not sure why. Okay, so a standing committee. So I'm now on social policy. I was on finance before. And um, what they do is when bills are referred to, uh, you know, when a bill passes in the House, uh, it can be referred to a committee. And that's where you uh, do clause by clause. You do, um, you kind of, you can do public hearings. Um, it's to basically dissect the bill to make it better or to solicit um, opinion on that bill before it goes back for final reading and royal assent. So I was on the finance committee. And uh, so we would look at any bill that had financial implications. But one of the biggest jobs that we did on finance committee is pre-budget consultation. So we know that there's the budget always delivered in the spring. And so during, um, well, we started, I think, maybe in December last year. I know they're starting in December this year. Uh, and all through January and all through, through February last year, I traveled the province uh, doing pre-budget consultations. So people who wanted to uh, come before the committee and say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is our organization. This is the money that we need um, to fund our organization appropriately and serve the people of Ontario. They would come before us and put in their request, put in their ask. And then we would determine, you know, whether or not that ask was valid. And then we would make recommendations back to the government and say, well, this is what we heard. This is what we suggest be included in the budget. Without getting too far into the weeds here, I wrote a newspaper column last year on how I was excited to go on pre-budget consultations because I wanted to see how different we were in Holman, Norfolk from the rest of Ontario. And we're not. We all have the same. We basically have the same problems, the same challenges, the same asks across this province. Now we are a little more unique because we are rural and we have uh, farm families we have to serve. So some of the areas we went into were more urban, but basically the challenges people are facing are the same. My concern with the pre-budget consultations last year would be my same concern uh, going into pre-budget consultations this year is that it's already a preconceived notion. So all of this money is spent on flying us all around the province. Um, you know, I went to Kenora last year. Um, we were we were all over flights, uh, you know, transportation, hotel rooms. But if it's already a preconceived notion, why are we doing it? We shouldn't just be doing it for window dressing, right? And in much of what I heard on committee uh, for pre-budget consultations last winter was not included in the budget, and that's very disheartening, not only for us as, as committee members who sit there and give up time in our riding, but it's also disheartening 
for the people who take time out of their professional and personal lives to sit before the committee and, 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 and present their ask, present their challenges and, and what they need from government. So um, while it, I found the work to be very, very interesting and it gave me a lot to write about, it is discouraging in a super majority government that it's it, it seems to be a preconceived notion. So anyway, that was finance committee. Yeah, but did, now, did any recommendations get changed that you guys made? I can't remember, Dave. To be honest, not, not um, nothing significant, obviously. Nothing significant. No, okay. and I will say that I'm now on social policy and how that change came about. Um, there were some by-elections where uh, there were t two uh, new Liberal members elected to the Ontario Legislature. And so I've been taken off of Finance Committee and I've been put over on social policy. I'm, I'm excited about that because social policy allows, that committee is going to allow me to talk about a lot of the things that we are experiencing here in Haldeman Norfolk. Um, that being said, it's a bit of an interesting change and uh, it's hard It's hard when you're not involved in, in uh, the legislative process every day to understand some of the things that go on. But I'll, I'll just say that I've been removed from the finance committee. I'm a fiscal conservative. So sure, I sit there as an independent and I can see social issues you know, all over the map, but I am a fiscal conservative. So someone somewhere has taken a fiscal conservative off the finance committee and replaced me with a liberal. No disrespect to the liberals. And I said that to my liberal uh, colleagues this week. I said, no disrespect, but it doesn't make sense. And, um, you know, whatever. Um, I'm open to new challenges. And I think this is a great opportunity for Haldeman Norfolk. The problem is, is I was just getting my feet wet on finance committee and just kind of getting that like solid. And, and now I'm, you know, I have to get my feet wet somewhere else. And that's okay. Um, but I will say that... Um, this is a job where there is no training. So they say to you, show up to social social policy committee Tuesday at nine o'clock and you just better know what to do, right? So it, it, it's, it's interesting. And um, we finished public hearings on social policy this week on Bill 135, the Convenient Care at Home Act. And, um, you know, it is the, the legislation that's, uh, you know, supposed to help fix home care. I'm not convinced. Uh, we heard from many professionals in the industry, and I've, I've written about it. My new newspaper column next week is all about uh, social policy and Bill 135 this week. Um, I'm not convinced that the that this legislation will change um, anything because it doesn't address the root cause of what's going on in home care. And that is the fact that we can't attract people to work in the home care industry because you can go into another institution, do the exact same or comparable work and get paid a lot more. So until they fix that wage parity, we're going to continue to see problems in home care. And um, so we had we we finished uh, hearings Wednesday late in the day and we had until Thursday at five o'clock to submit our amendments to the bill, um, you know, we on the opposition side, the, the NDP liberals, and of course myself, we are considered the opposition on that committee. Um, you know, we had a discussion that it doesn't matter what we put forward to amend, it's going to, it will never pass, right? Because we are dealing with a super majority government. But I put time and effort into proposing one recommendation or one amendment, and that is to ensure that all workers doing comparable uh, work, whether they're working in home care or they're working in a hospital or they're working in a long-term care home, they have to be paid equal. And until we do that, there's going to be these problems. So that is my one amendment and we'll see how that goes. We uh, we do clause by clause on, on amendments next week. You really jumped right in. I did. <laughs> yeah, you were literally, Sorry. Okay, let's put an amendment in. Let's go. Yeah, right? yeah. We're I, ready I, to play. I, I'm excited. This stuff really excites me because, um, you know, home care is such a huge problem. And, and this is a great bill for me to start into social policy because I saw the issues uh, while I was on the campaign trail last year. I re remember going to homes and seeing folks who were not getting the home care they needed. One couple in particular in Port Rowan, I'll never forget them. The husband had just come out of the hospital. The wife was not healthy herself. She broke down in front of me and said, 
I don't know who's going to get more sick faster. He's just been released from hospital, but I'm not well. Our PSWs aren't showing up and I'm expected to look after him and I can't do it. It's, it's, and I, you know what, in social policy, I, kudos because we're talking mental health, we're talking poverty, we're talking everything. All sorts of things. Yeah, and it's a big, it's a big mm -hmm. agenda. And if you can keep, you know, pushing that, you know, st sticking your nose in there and just bugging them enough, something's got to go through. Something's going to have to happen to make it yeah. make it a little bit better for the folks all over all over the province and and all over Norfolk as well, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it kind of leads to, you know, I heard recently too. You've been talking a little bit about. You brought it up in the house. How come the long-term care beds, they aren't getting right. done? What's going on there? Yeah, so that was a bit of a frustrating um, response that I got back from the minister. Um, you know, he said, the member opposite, if there's a need for these beds, uh, she should demonstrate, she should come to me and demonstrate it. It was already demonstrated, uh, you know, four or five years ago when they approved these beds, these are already approved beds. We're not asking for him to approve beds. He's already approved them. And so just get the shovel in the ground and we just continue to get, um, you know, the runaround on this. And, uh, you know, I went to him after a question period and I said like, look, you know, you've told me to come to you, so here I am. And he's like, well, you know, send me an email. I'm like, we've sent you umpteen emails. And, and the clock is ticking because many of those beds like Dover Cliffs, are going to be, um, they're not going to be in compliance in 2025. So the talk, the clock is ticking to get these new beds built because these are going to be uh, the beds that are going to be taken out of the system it, come 2025. So they've got to start getting shovels in the ground. But what this government fails to admit is that the environment to build anything right now doesn't exist. And we found out a few weeks ago that they are counting uh, long-term care beds as homes. Uh, so they talk about creating a million and a half new homes over the next 10 years. They're now counting long-term care beds towards those million and a half homes. That's not appropriate. It makes zero sense. Like, zero oh, sense. Two, two totally it, different things. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Kind of reminds me of your oranges and lemons topic on the uh, fall economic. Right. <laughs> Do you want yeah. do you want to take a minute? I know that was an important aspect of what was going through. And you you kind of uh, I read your piece and you kind of really broke it down nicely, I thought. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. explain to the folks what's going on there. Well, you know, there's some good things in the fall economic statement, and but the devil is always in the details, right? So, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, uh you know, a little bit of good, a little bit of bad, you got to equal it out. Like yesterday, we, you know, we had uh, a vote on, uh, on, um, on uh, the fall economic statement and voted in favor of it because th there, there are some good things that can help us. Uh, does it go far enough? No, it doesn't. But you still have to vote for those good things that are contained within that bill. Is there anything in there that will harm us? No. So, you know, the lemon is the fact that it doesn't go far enough. The orange is the fact that, well, we can really use some of the things that are in there. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I got you on that. I understood that. And it's just kind of, you know, I kind of worry, you know, this is December. Folks are struggling. I mean, you're seeing it. I'm seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, it, you know, is there hope on the horizon? Do you see it? It's with Christmas coming, like, I, you know, I think everybody's looking at keeping that budget kind of tight this Christmas. Mortgage yeah. rates are still pretty high. They're not coming down yet. Inflation. Yeah. It's, 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 see, it's a tough go for everybody. I, I want to see the glass half full, Dave, but I don't. Um, I think we're going to continue to struggle for some time now. Um, you know, people people are hurting. People are struggling. I was in uh, in a, a few uh, retail outlets last night. I, I went and did the um, light up the, the light, uh, light up the tree in Waterford last night for hospice. And um, some of the stores were open uh, late, uh, kind of Christmas shopping. And, and I went to a few of them and spent some money. And uh, then I came into Simcoe and, and went to Winners. And I actually had cash because I sold something online. So I had cash. And I, and I said to the um, cashier, I said, oh, funny, I have cash. I never have cash. And she says, um, people are actually coming in more now with cash because they're on a budget. 
And she says, so once the money's gone, uh, they've got it set in their head that they're not using plastic because it's going to get them into trouble. And, um, you know, that's that's not a bad thing to, no. for us to be frugal, for us to spend our money wisely. Um, but I do worry for those who are having a hard time uh, paying the bills and and putting food on the table. So it's it's one thing for those of us who might say, hey, listen, I'm going to, you know, tighten things up with respect to Christmas presents and and who I'm buying for or how much I'm spending per person, that's different than saying, man, I don't know how I'm going to afford, you know, groceries this week. And, and it is happening. And it it's, um, you know, it's so disheartening and it's heart wrenching um, to see people struggle like this because we all, we can all see who's struggling, right? And it's a great reminder folks to, if you if you got a little extra, drop it off the food bank. Help out. There's going to be mm -hmm. you know that that Salvation Army will be starting. Yeah, yeah. Salvation Army will be starting their kettle campaign soon, and and I always uh, do a few shifts for um, Salvation Army because they you know put everything back into the community. Um, you know you don't have to give much. Everybody giving a little bit uh, adds to a, adds up to a whole lot that makes somebody else's life just a little bit better. And off, off air, you and I were talking about empathy. We really need to remember that and help each other out this time of year. All year mm -hmm. long, we should be, but especially this time of year when folks are mm -hmm. are definitely struggling. Uh, you're, and you're seeing it all over all over the country, not just all over Norfolk. Um, one more question: I want to ask you about the large animal vet program. I saw that you were you're a little pissy about that. So explain. <laughs> so yeah, I sent out a news release on that. Um, you know, we do have a shortage here as well. And, um, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, opened an incentive program and, and largely it's for the North. And, and that's fine and dandy. They want to open up farming in the North. And, and so they created an incentive program for the North. But why aren't we taking care of the farmers that we already have? So it's great that you're providing incentives for an area that is uh, not robust with respect to farming. But we've got an area down here who's going like, we don't know what to do with our animals. And we've been telling the government uh, for the past few years, we've got a problem and yet it wasn't addressed. So uh, very frustrating. It's an issue that I'll stay on top of and continue to press the minister on. And I'd just like to also say um, any farmer who uh, is involved with risk management program, RMP or SDRM, I went after the minister this week in, in the Ontario legislature asking when uh, this government is going to bump up RMP to $250 million. Right now it sits at $150 million. Um, you know, it's a program that works well for farmers. I won't get into the details of it. If, if farmers are listening, uh, they know how it supports them. And um, the beef farmers were at Queens Park uh, back at the beginning of October. And the beef farmers, like like all of our farm groups, when they come to Queens Park, they, they treat us so well, right? They do their lobbying. But they also provide us with, you know, if, if they're the egg farmers, they give us an omelet breakfast. The beef farmers did this great big spread. They do it all the time out on the front lawn. And, um, you know, I, I was so disappointed because in the house that day, and I had just met with the beef farmers prior to going into question period, and they told me their number one ask was the bump up of $100 million to the RMP program. And we go in the Ontario legislature for question period and, and, uh, the member for um, Peterborough Kawartha, uh, he gets up and he, we call them lob ball questions. So it's a government to government question. So he asks his uh, government colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, how, um, you know, what the government is doing to support beef farmers so that they continue to fuel the economy. And the Minister of Agriculture, nice, uh, you know, nice person, our farmers like her, but she completely talked around the number one reason why the beef farmers were there. And and I'm sitting there and I'm going, are you kidding me? The beef farmers are sitting in the gallery. They know you're not talking about RMP. This is why they're here. And yet 45 minutes later, we go out on the front lawn and you know, there's the government members in aprons carving beef when they've completely ignored the number one reason why these people are here. So I called them out on it. I called her out on it um, on Wednesday morning during question period, I said, you know, you detailed what our beef farmers do for us, but what you didn't talk about was what our government's going to do to help them. And, and a bump up of $100 million to a, an insurance program, an assurance program 
uh, would give our farm families the ability to succession plan a lot better. It would give them peace of mind in what we know is a very volatile environment these days. And, and you know, again, the question wasn't answered, but the minister said there's something coming this Monday. So we'll wait and see what that is. Actually, I do have one more question now that you mentioned it. Um, did you get a little trouble recently? Have you been in a little trouble? Did you get reprimanded? Oh, on social policy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I don't think enough people know that you're causing trouble in the house, young lady. Let's talk about this. I think it's time we had this discussion. Yeah. So, you know, I think I'm, I don't know how people view me at Queens Park, but I, I you know, I, I just go there and I'm honest and I'm genuine and, and colleagues on all sides of the house, they really appreciate that. And they tell me that, um, but on social policy the other day, I got accused of kind of leading the witness and, um, it, it was called out from a government member uh, who didn't like my line of questioning. And, you know, I didn't argue. I just said, fair enough. I'll, I'll move on to my next question. Um, but it really wasn't up to that member to tell me that I was leading the witness and it were up to that to member to tell me that, uh, <laughs> that my question was out of line, but, um, they probably should have let me finish my line of questioning because I had a point that would have really uh, driven home a real fiscal conservative type uh, response. And, uh, so they missed out on that. They never answered the question, did they? No. Ah, all right. Uh, got to give you a chance to say Merry Christmas to everyone. Wish everybody a happy new year. Three, two, one, go. I want to thank all of you and Haldeman Norfolk for, for being so wonderful throughout the past year. We, we truly are blessed here and we have a lot to be grateful for. And, you know, Christmas is a time of happiness. It's a time of cheer. Um, but my heart does go out and I will be thinking of those who may be struggling in one way or another. And for those who are grieving, you know, I hope that you can draw comfort from those around you. And um, for the rest of you, Please take time to reflect, take time to reminisce and get together with people that you love and hold dear. Uh, it's such a magical time of the season or time of the year for most of us. And um, please reach, with, reach deep inside and find that inner child and just enjoy the time with, with your family and friends. Merry Christmas to you all.